Chapter 75 Mary Lou was one of the girls in the front office. Mary Lou had style. She drove a three-year-old Cadillac and lived with her mother. She entertained members of the L.A. Philharmonic, movie directors, cameramen, lawyers, real estate agents, chiropractors, holy men, ex-aviators, ballet dancers, and other entertainment figures such as wrestlers and defensive left ends. But she had never married and she had never gotten out of the front office of Graphic Cherub Art Supply. Except now and then for a quickie fuck with Bud in the ladies' room, giggling with the door bolted after she thought the rest of us had gone home. Also, she was religious and loved to play the horses, but preferably from a reserved seat and preferably at Santa Anita. She looked down on Hollywood Park. She was desperate and she was choosy at the same time, and, in a way, beautiful, but she didn't have quite enough going for her to become what she imagined herself to be. One of her jobs was to bring a copy of the orders back to me after she had typed them. The clerks picked up another copy of the same orders out of the basket to fill when they weren't waiting on customers, and I'd match them up before I packed the stuff. The first time she came back with some orders, she wore a tight black skirt, high heels, a white blouse, and a gold and black scarf around her neck. She had a cute turned up nose, a marvelous behind and fine breast. She was tall. Class. Bud tells me you paint, she said. A bit. Oh, I think that's marvelous. We have such interesting people working here. What do you mean? Well, we have a janitor, an old man, Maurice. He's from France. He comes once a week and cleans the store. He paints too. He buys all his paints and brushes and canvas from us. But he's strange. He never speaks, just nods and points. He just points to things he wants to buy. Uh Uh-huh. He's strange. Uh Uh-huh. Last week I went into the ladies' room, and he was there, mopping up in the dark. He'd been in there an hour. Uh. You don't talk either. Oh yes, I'm all right. Mary Lou turned and walked away. I watched the buttocks work on that tall body. Magic. Some women were magic. I had packed a few orders when this old guy came walking down the aisle. He had a grubby gray mustache that drooped around his mouth. He was small and bent. He was dressed in black, had a red scarf tied around his throat, and he wore a blue beret. Out from under the blue beret came much long, gray hair, uncombed. Maurice's eyes were the most distinctive thing about him. They were a vivid green and seemed to look out from deep within his head. He had bushy eyebrows. He was smoking a long, thin cigar. Hi, kid, he said. Maurice didn't have much of a French accent. He sat on the end of the packing table and crossed his legs. I thought you didn't talk. Oh, that? Balls. I wouldn't piss on a fly for them. Why bother? How come you clean the crapper in the dark? That's Mary Lou. I look at her. Then I go in there and come all over the floor. I mop it up. She knows. You paint? Yes. I'm working on a canvas in my room now. As big as this wall. Not a mural. A canvas. I am painting a man's life. From his birth through the vagina. Through all the years of his existence. Then finally into the grave. I look at people in the park. I use them. That Mary Lou. She'd make one good fuck. What? Maybe. It could be a mirage. I lived in France. I met Picasso. Did you really? Shit, I did. He's okay. How'd you meet him? I knocked on his door. Was he pissed? No. No, he wasn't pissed. Some people don't like him. Some people don't like anybody who is famous. And some people don't like anybody who isn't. People don't count. I wouldn't piss on a fly for them. What Picasso say? Well, I asked him, I said, Master, what can I do to make my work better? No shit? 
no shit. What did he say? He said, I can't tell you anything about your work. You must do it all by yourself. Ha. Yes. Pretty good. Yes. Got a match. I gave him some. His cigar had gone out. My brother is rich, said Maurice. He has disowned me. He doesn't like my drinking. He doesn't like my painting. But your brother never met Picasso. Maurice stood up and smiled. No, he never met Picasso. Maurice walked back down the aisle toward the front of the store, cigar smoke curling back over his shoulder. He had kept my book of matches. Chapter 76 Bud came back pushing three one-gallon cans of paint on the order wagon. He put them on the packing table. They were labeled crimson. He handed me three labels. The label said vermilion. We're out of vermilion, he said. Soak off these labels and paste on the vermilion labels. There's quite a difference between crimson and vermilion, I said. Just do it. Bud left me some rags and a razor blade. I soaked the rags in water and wrapped them around the cans. Then I scraped off the old labels and glued on the new ones. He came back a few minutes later. He had a can of ultramarine and a label for cobalt blue. Well, he was getting closer. Chapter 77 Paul was one of the clerks. He was fat, about 28. His eyes were very large, bulging. He was on pills. He showed me a handful. They were all different sizes and colors. Want some? No. Go ahead. Take one. All right. I took a yellow. I take them all, he said. Damn things. Someone to take me up. Someone to take me down. I let them fight over me. That's supposed to be rough on you. I know. Say, why don't you come to my place after work? I've got a woman. We've all got women. I've got something better. What? My girlfriend bought me this reducing machine for my birthday. We fuck on it. It moves up and down. We don't have to do any work. The machine does all the work. It sounds good. You and I can use that machine. It makes a lot of noise, but as long as we don't use it after 10 p.m., it's okay. Who gets on top? What difference does it make? I can take it or give it. Top or bottom, it doesn't matter. Doesn't it? Hell no. We'll flip for it. Let me think it over. All right. Want another pill? Yeah. Give me another yellow. I'll check with you at closing time. Sure. Paul was there at closing. Well, I can't do it, Paul. I'm straight. It's a great machine. Once you get on that machine, you'll forget everything. I can't do it. Well, come on over and look at my pills anyhow. All right. I can do that. I locked the back door. Then we walked out the front together. Mary Lou was sitting in the office smoking a cigarette and talking to Bud. Good night, men, said Bud with a big grin on his face. Paul's place was a block off to the south. He had a lower front apartment with the windows facing 7th Street. There's the machine, he said. He turned it on. Look at it. Look at it. It sounds like a washing machine. The woman upstairs, she sees me in the hall and she says, Paul, you must really be a clean guy. I hear you washing your clothes three or four times a week. Turn it off, I said. Look at my pills. I've got thousands of pills. Thousands. I don't even know what some of them are. Paul had all the bottles on the coffee table. There were 11 or 12 bottles all different sizes and shapes and filled with colored pills. They were beautiful. As I watched, he opened a bottle and took three or four pills out of it and swallowed them. Then he opened another bottle and took a couple of pills. Then he opened a third bottle. Come on, what the hell, he said. Let's get on the machine. I'll take a rain check. I got to go. All right, he said. If you won't fuck me, I'll fuck myself. I closed the door behind me and walked out on the street. I heard him turn on the machine. Chapter 78 Mr. Manders walked back to where I was working and stood and looked at me. I was packing a large order of paints 
and he stood there watching me. Manders had been the original owner of the store, but his wife had run off with a black man, and he had started drinking. He drank his way out of the ownership. Now he was just a salesman, and another man owned his store. You putting fragile labels on these cartons? Yes. Do you pack them well? Plenty of newspaper and straw. I think I'm doing it right. Do you have enough fragile labels? Yes. There's a whole box full under the bench here. Are you sure you know what you're doing? You don't look like a shipping clerk. What does a shipping clerk look like? They wear aprons. You don't wear an apron. Oh. Smith Barnsley called to say that they had received a broken pint jar of rubber cement in a shipment. I didn't answer. You let me know if you run out of fragile labels. Sure. Manders walked off down the aisle. Then he stopped and turned and watched me. I ripped some tape off the dispenser and with an extra flourish, I wrapped it around the carton. Manders turned and walked away. Bud came running back. How many six-foot squeegees you got in stock? None. This guy wants five six-foot squeegees now. He's waiting for them. Make them up. Bud ran off. A squeegee is a piece of board with a rubber edge. It's used in silk screening. I went to the attic, got the lumber down, measured off five six-foot sections, and sawed the boards. Then I began drilling holes into the wood along one edge. You bolted the rubber into place after drilling the holes. Then you had to sand the rubber down until it was level, a perfectly straight edge. If the rubber edge wasn't perfectly straight, the silk screen process wouldn't work, and the rubber had a way of curling and warping and resisting. Bud was back in three minutes. You got those squeegees ready yet? No. He ran back to the front. I drilled, turned screws, sanded. In five more minutes, he was back. You got those squeegees ready yet? No. He ran off. I had one six-foot squeegee finished and was halfway through another when he came back again. Never mind, he left. Bud walked back up toward the front. Chapter 79 The store was going broke. Each day the orders were smaller and smaller. There was less and less to do. They fired Picasso's buddy and had me mop the crappers, empty the baskets, hang the toilet paper. Each morning I swept and watered the sidewalk in front of the store. Once a week I washed the windows. One day I decided to clean up my own quarters. One of the things I did was to clean out the carton area where I kept all the empty cartons I used for shipping. I got them all out of there and swept up the trash. As I was cleaning up I noticed a small oblong gray box at the bottom of the bin. I picked it up and opened it. It contained 24 large-sized camel hair brushes. They were fat and beautiful and sold for $10 each. I didn't know what to do. I looked at them for some time, then closed the lid, walked out the back, and put them in a trash can in the alley. Then I put all the empty cartons back in the bin. That night I left as late as possible. I walked to the nearby cafe and had a coffee and apple pie. Then I came out, walked down the block, and turned up the alley. I walked up the alley and was a quarter of the way when I saw Bud and Mary Lou enter the alley from the other end. There was nothing to do but to keep walking. It was final. We got closer and closer. Finally, as I passed them, I said hi. They said hi. I kept walking. I walked out the other end of the alley and across the street and into a bar. I sat down. I sat there and had a beer and then had another. A woman down the bar asked me if I had a match. I got up and lighted her cigarette. As I did that, she farted. I asked her if she lived in the neighborhood. She said she was from Montana. I remembered an unhappy night I'd had in Cheyenne, Wyoming, which is near Montana. Finally, I left and walked back to the alley. I went up to the trash can and reached in. It was still there, the oblong gray box, 
It didn't feel empty. I slipped it through the neck of my shirt and it dropped down, slipped down, slid down against my gut and lay there. I walked back to where I lived.